Hey, everybody. Welcome to NCSA's latest webinar, The Case for Profound Autism, featuring Dr. Lee Wachtel of Kennedy Krieger Institute. Uh, my name is Jill Escher, and I am the president of NCSA. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of logistics here, and then I'll hand over the reins to our vice president, Dr. Amy Lutz. Um, I want to start off just thanking um, University of Iowa and also Autism Society of Iowa um, for first pre presenting this presentation with Dr. Wachtel um, at their Severe Autism or Profound Autism Conference that they held recently. Um, it wasn't recorded, however, <laughs> so it occurred to us that you know the, this presentation was so good and so packed with really useful information. Um, that it should be repeated um, and recorded. And Dr. Wachtel very kindly and generously agreed to do so. Um, and we are recording this. It looks like we'll be able to post the entirety of this um, because Dr. Wachtel has changed out some of the slides that orig originally we thought would have to be edited out. Um, you can most certainly uh, post questions. We have the Q&A open for you. You can also talk in chat. Uh, Amy and I will monitor both of those, um, but chat gets a little discombobulated, so Q&A might be the better source um, for asking your questions, okay? Um, and it also enables um, answering you know, uh, through keyboard as well. Um, with that, I, I do think we will be able to post the recording fairly shortly on our website. You will receive an email about it, and I think we will post it on the homepage, so it will be very easy to find. Um, okay, uh, with that, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Lutz. Thank you, Jill. Um, it is my tremendous honor and privilege to introduce one of my favorite humans, uh, Dr. Lee Wachtel. Uh, she has been Jonah's uh, doctor since he was nine years old, and he is 24 now. So um, I am tremendously grateful for everything uh, Lee has done for our family. And I consider, I don't think there's a greater expert on severe or profound autism uh, than, than she is. So Dr. Wachtel received her undergraduate degree in 1993 in Romance Languages and Literatures of All Things from Princeton and her medical degree from Johns Hopkins in 1998. She completed general and child and adolescent psychiatry training at the University of Maryland Psychiatry Residency Training Program in Baltimore and joined the Kennedy Krieger Institute in 2003 where she serves as medical director of the neurobehavioral unit, specializing in the care of children, adolescents, and young adults with autism and intellectual disability who present with concomitant severe psychiatric and behavioral disturbance. Dr. Wachtel is a professor of psychiatry at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Her clinical and research interests focus on pediatric catatonia, particularly in autism spectrum disorders, with emphasis on repetitive, self-injurious behaviors and optimal catatonia treatment paradigms, including electroconvulsive therapy. Dr. Wachtel is the author of more than three dozen scientific manuscripts and textbook chapters, and has lectured extensively throughout the United States and abroad. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Amy. I'm going to share my screen just to make sure that that works. Yeah, okay. Do you see the full screen? Awesome, okay. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction. And I'm honored to be here. Um, I was really pleased with the response to this lecture at the University of Iowa, I guess just about 10 days ago. Um, and I'm happy to present it again um, and kind of share, uh, share the knowledge and share the case for profound autism, which has become really more and more relevant um, in recent years. Alrighty, so hopefully we can get through this without any technological snafus that sometimes plague me. All right, so first of all, why are we here? Um, why would we want to emphasize profound autism? We're here talking about profound autism because this represents children and families who are truly suffering. These are not children and families who are experiencing any type of gift associated with autism. And sadly, they're at a very high risk of not being seen, kind of pushed under the proverbial rug and not being included. 
and as well as being shortchanged, both as children and then as adults. And with this patient population, answers are sorely needed to improve lives, both for the children themselves and for their families. So the profound autism proposition is um, actually a kind of an idea that's just about 15 months old. Um, this was first floated in the Lancet Commission um, publication in November of 2021 as a suggestion and as a new moniker to describe an individual who has significant intellectual disability, an IQ below 50, minimal or no language, requires round the clock supervision, and requires assistance with activities of daily living. So that's kind of the um, background for what profound autism, what that term is supposed to represent. We're gonna go through some of the um, history of it leading up to it before we come back actually to the same slide. Okay. Um, again, why is this important to talk about? Because these patients are really as common as the grass. Um, this is just a um, post from a Facebook page, um, again, of something that I hear probably several times a day, a family with an individual with profound autism who is more or less a prisoner in the home, whose life has come to a complete standstill, an inability for the child himself, adult child and the family to make any type of headway and a family again kind of at the end of their rope. I think these issues are really important and I know you know kind of today in recent years we talk a lot in the United States about issues of equality and equity and everyone's the same and everyone is supposed to have the same benefits and the same advantages and privileges. Um, this is obviously a picture from Dr. Seuss's Starbelly Sneetches, which was one of my favorite stories as a, as a child. And, you know, I think it's really apt because in as much as uh, no one would say that um, anyone should be excluded from uh, the uh, Frankfurter roasts and marshmallow toasts of um, Dr. Seuss's story, at the same time, if we really can't say that not that everybody is the same because they're just not. And um, that applies in autism, just like it applies in the world in general. And I think we have to draw some distinctions between equity and people being able to access the things that they need based on their own individual needs. And this kind of blind adherence to the idea that everyone is the same because they just aren't. Okay. Um, so you know, the DSM is um, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual used in our field and typically guides most of psychiatry. But in recent years, those of us working with individuals with profound autism have often kind of questioned like, well, exactly like how accurate are these paradigms in autism spectrum disorder? Are they a bane or a boon? Do they help our cause or hurt our cause in working with those individuals with profound autism? And of course, the reason we care about diagnoses is because usually they lead to treatment paradigms, service options, research, and then particularly important in the United States, um, payment for access to those types of treatments. You know, I always like to say, um, and um, I learned very well from my mentors, that the DSM, in as much as it is considered somewhat the Bible of psychiatry, was not divinely given. Moses did not receive the DSM at Sinai. The DSM is a creation of man, and as such, is kind of exposed to the weaknesses of man and also the political and other influences that the DSM has weathered over the years. This kind of made me laugh. This is a... Um, a, a friend and a colleague who um, had the DSM in her guest room at the bedside table, kind of like how they have um, Bibles in um, hotel rooms. And um, again, it's just a reminder that um, the DSM might be interesting and might be used um, pretty extensively, but it was not delivered from above. Okay. I always liked history and found that um, understanding the history of things in medicine um, is very informative and often helps us to not make the same type of errors. And it's really interesting to look back before the DSM even was in existence, the whole idea of autism was um, linked to something very different. And at the turn of the 20th century, um, autism was considered part and parcel of what Kaplan called a dementia precox and then what Bleuler subsequently named schizophrenia very different type of um, psychiatric entity. In the DSM-1 and DSM-2, so in 1952 and 1968, and that actually wasn't so long ago, just about, uh, what, 53 years ago, um, 
autism was still considered part and parcel of schizophrenia. Um, this is obviously recognized as incorrect, but that also underscores the fact that the DSM evolves, the DSM changes as we learn more, and the DSM isn't always um, the final word. So the DSM-3, um, just um, 43 years ago, is where um, autism was kind of officially divorced from the schizophrenia diagnosis and recognized as a separate entity. Why did that happen? Well, um, by that time, um, science was very much influenced by um, all the work that had been done looking at autism, particularly the group of Sir Michael Rudder, um, really defining autism spectrum disorders, and the 1970s um, growth in terms of studies, scientific studies that established a brain-based nature of autism with its association, for example, with medical conditions like seizures, and also um, differential um, a differential incidence of autism comparing monozygotic to dizygotic twins. Um, it's just a fun fact for today. Um, in 1980, when that DSM-3 came out, the incidence of autism was just three in 10,000. Um, it isn't, I, I always like to point out that um, autism isn't the only thing that was, what, that was divorced in the DSM from schizophrenia. So in 2013, when the DSM-5 came out, um, the diagnosis of catatonia, which is somewhat um, near and dear to my heart and has figured in a lot of my research, was also officially divorced from the diagnosis of schizophrenia. Again, underscoring the fact that the DSM changes and that one version of the DSM doesn't necessarily dictate the next. So then we get to DSM-4, which I kind of, I like to think of as like this big like open umbrella. We had classic autism, spectrum disorder, Asperger, um, pervasive developmental disorder, and then Rett syndrome and childhood disintegrated disorder. Again, we have an evolution in scientific thinking and understanding, and it was recognized that Rett syndrome and childhood disintegrative disorder more or less represented neurodegenerative conditions that were not part and parcel of autism, even though, for example, some people with Rett syndrome have an additional diagnosis of autism. And then the DSM-5, and the DSM-5 came out in, in 2013, we kind of see that umbrella close or snap shut. And um, the DSM consolidated these five prior disparate diagnoses, again, with Rett syndrome, childhood disintegrative disorder put in different categories, more of neurological, um, neurodegenerative types of issues. And the DSM-5 says that you know, part of their goal in this change was to increase diagnostic reliability, use fewer criteria to express how autism spectrum disorder can manifest itself across different sexes, across age, across culture, and to offer broader criteria to capture the range of expression of ASD. Now, in my mind, this just sort of opened up um, right off the bat, somewhat of like a slippery slope, moving away from a discrete medical diagnosis and starting to drop into um, the realm of identity, which I think has become somewhat dangerous for the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. Other changes in DSM-5 include the removal of delay or lack of spoken language criteria, the addition of unusual sensory responses and interests, as well as all these other caveats, Criteria for autism can be met now or by history. They can be met later in life when social demands exceed an individual's innate abilities. So you could be diagnosed with autism at age 30, even though that never was a consideration when you were 10. Criteria can be met after normal development with subsequent regression. And again, just with these changes, you see how, while that umbrella may have closed in terms of the rubric and the term only being one, there is a huge um, subsequent variation in how autism could present itself according to the DSM. Now, the DSM-5 also, I think the DSM committee probably recognized the fact that not everybody was the same in that umbrella because the DSM-5 also allows us to give severity levels. Um, again, these are based on core autism symptoms, so severity levels one, two, and three um, uh, linked to the support needs that an individual might require as well as specifiers for comorbidities, including intellectual disability, language disorder, additional medical disorder, and psychiatric comorbidities. Um, unfortunately, it's not a requirement to list those when you give a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, but the DSM does allow for these specifications. 
The DSM-5 um, revised version actually has um, further expanded the autism diagnosis in terms of specifiers that allows um, the clinician to indicate that there is an additional problem associated with um, autism, the, the child's autism spectrum disorder um, to include, for example, the behavioral problems that so often plague our children. So it really like kind of brings you back to wondering like, well, is all autism actually the same? And I would argue not. Um, I think it's some, become somewhat of a different umbrella. The umbrella, again, it may be closed and it may be labeled one thing, ASD, but I see um, within the diagnosis that actually like what I kind of call infinite permutations to how autism spectrum disorder can present. And I kind of look at it this way, like if you think a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, and then you can have plus or minus an intellectual disability, you can have language disability, psychiatric comorbidities, medical comorbidities, the level of support that you need and problems, plus or minus problems, it kind of would allow if you were able to kind of shuffle it like a deck of cards for infinite permutations in how an individual who receives that ASD diagnosis presents. The diagnosis of autism is not the only diagnosis in the DSM that has this problem. Um, major depression um, has been plagued by the same problem uh, for years in that according to the DSM, the classically like melancholic patient um, who would fail like an old school dexamethasone suppression test will get the same major depression, major depressive disorder as uh, someone who um, showed up in the ER and said she was gonna kill herself because her mom caught her smoking pot or told her that she couldn't have a party. Um, obviously you'd have to be um, kind of stupid to argue that both individuals are suffering from the same pathology. And I always ask people um, to look, and I recognize that these images are not pleasant to look at, but that's kind of why we're here because we need to be able to speak to them. Whether our current conceptualization captures what you see here. And, oh, well, there was a video, but it has uh, disappeared. That is unfortunate. Um, so, okay, we will just move move ahead. Um, and again, I, 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 I challenge people to ask, you know, are these individuals the same? Greta Thunberg and all of her, um, you know, uh, campaigning for like environmental, um, for environmental saving and the climate, you know, claims that she benefits from the gift of autism. And um, you have to ask if the individuals in the preceding slide were um, benefiting from any type of gift associated with their autism. Um, interestingly, um, even autistic individuals such as Temple Grandin have spoken out um, just about how ridiculous this is and that the spectrum has become so broad that it really doesn't make much sense that people receive, receive the same diagnosis. Now, uh, I don't think that um, Temple Grandin is bothered at all by what people say about her comments, but she actually um, was subject to a lot of criticism for saying this. And um, this is just a shout out uh, actually uh, to my grandmother and um, quotes that I've sometimes heard from my father um, referring to um, what we commonly call narishkart kite in our family, just a whole bunch of nonsense. And grandmother Zelda would definitely have said that this is just a bunch of narishkite. Narishkite comes from the German word um, fool. Um, I mean, but it's really difficult today because we've gotten to a point in 2023 where diagnosis and disease, particularly with autism and developmental disabilities and intellectual disabilities, has started to encroach upon these issues of identity. And in 2023, those are really like touchy subjects. It's very difficult to object to or challenge or even discuss um, anything that has anything to do um, with identity. Um, even though that seems somewhat unusual, and um, as you see in the name tag, hello, my name is autism, is that an identity and what is going on that people are adopting this as an identity as compared to a medical diagnosis? Many people talk about a social model of autism. Um, this kind of makes me laugh again from a historical perspective because the Italians tried this at the uh, Basalia movement after World War II with the suggestion that um, all uh, psychiatric illnesses were due to the um, the shortcomings of society um, rather to rather than biological pathology. And this is now that didn't work out so well in Italy for a um, mental health care. 
Um, but this topic has been raised um, more recently in terms of autism, suggesting that no, it's actually not a medical condition and people wouldn't have any challenges related to autism if we lived in a different type of society. Maybe on a different planet, I don't know. Um, but we do see a lot about the social model of disability. And um, this is something that's been adopted frequently by um, neurodiversity campaigners. I always have to laugh at some of these comments, such as um, the neurodiversity um, claim that we should always presume competence. Uh, this is a quote from one of my colleagues um, in Israel who has a uh, autistic son, who um, I will state is probably one of the most delightful individuals that you could ever possibly hope to meet, a true gift to his family, his community, and to society at large. Um, but Jenny's response to this was, my son Yehuda would really like to be a pilot. Neither El Al nor the Israeli Defense Forces are giving him a plane. But if they did, would you like to be a passenger on his aircraft? Kind of, I, uh, i.e., um, are you really willing to put your money where your mouth is? Um, this was an article that just recently appeared in the time between the um, lecture in the University of Iowa, which we all kind of got a chuckle out of. And this is from Spectrum News, where um, physicians, so MDs who've been through medical school, residency training, and all of that, um, who uh, report that they have autism, speak out against the stigma um, that they experience in their daily lives. And I just, you know, you just have to step back and ask yourselves, what similarities do they have, for example, with individuals like those on my unit and all the individuals who would meet that profound autism diagnosis? Jenny also had a comment to this article. Um, and um, again, she was just sort of blown away and um, had to kind of make a joke that these children are so similar to their son, to her son, who had a conversation with his moose costume um, and then watched the Berenstein Bears before he eating his eighth apple of the day. He does have somewhat of a compulsive habit um, of eating um, a lot of apples. Could be worse. Okay. Um, you know, I think it's really interesting because a lot of people in the neurodiversity world talk about like kind of a rejection of pathology. And um, this is actually a, um, a, a part of a, a, an online um, publication from an advocate um, talking about pathology, pathologization and its link to you know, the idea of suffering, pathos or, or suffering, where this person actually says and gives this example, well, I have asthma. Fortunately, it's well controlled. You know, thank goodness and modern medicine is able to allow me to live my life more or less safely. But she's saying that um, asthma is something that um, for her um, is not a gift, adds no written richness or quality um, to her life and can actually be very unpleasant, scary, and even dangerous. And um, for many individuals with profound autism, their autism presents in the way asthma presents for this patient. And I just ask, I think I'm probably asking, um, preaching to the choir in this lecture, but I find myself often asking people in general, are these things not, um, not demonstrations of suffering? Repeated emergency room visits, hospitalization, surgeries, detached retinas, cataracts, broken bones, cerebral hemorrhages, lost eyes. We've seen all of that. It's awful. Destroyed homes, injuries to caregivers, and the frank global exhaustion that um, families of children with profound autism experience. Um, many are familiar with um, the very sad and tragic death of Feta Amalidi as she tried to save her son who had pro profound autism from a house fire. Both of them died um, because her son was not capable of understanding at the time that he needed to move and needed to leave um, in order to uh, not be consumed by the fire. Um, Feta's sister has um, commented that many of those who care for individuals with profound autism are truly warriors and are truly individuals who are fighting um, day in and day out um, for their loved ones. And these are some things that I sometimes call like uh, 
advocacy luxuries. Eye contact is overrated. Um, did you happen to know that autistic adults don't like the use of the puzzle piece? Well, that really like doesn't interest me at all. Um, frankly, when, when you work in a facility where um, the daily tasks involve um, caring for people recovering from retinal reattachment surgery, um, updating um, different regimens and protocols for protective equipment, and dealing with um, medical disaster after medical disaster, my interest really doesn't, doesn't lie in whether people like the puzzle piece or not, because I have such bigger fish to fry in that in my own clinical setting. And I know that the families that we're serving and the hundreds of families who are on the wait list and hoping to be served by Kennedy Krieger or by other facilities who work with individuals with profound autism also have much bigger fish to fry. And these types of things would be truly luxuries in their lives to be able to consider. This really made me irritated about a year ago, a autism awareness panel was able to be shut down actually by Harvard students. So you have to think about Harvard students must be some of the most privileged elite individuals in the United States, um, but because of their concerns for ableism, were able to shut down a panel that could have actually led to significant scientific exchange addressing the needs of people who were significantly less privileged than they were. And sadly, what we often see within the, within the movement of neurodiversity is that the ultimate goal is to remove autism as a disorder, to remove it as a diagnosis, as something that needs to be studied, learned about, and for um, treatments and other options to be developed. We don't want to go in this direction, but many people are pushing that. Because sadly, this really flies in the face of the reality for countless individuals with autism. Um, this is from a, a Western newspaper, yeah, Reno, Reno, Nevada. Again, as common as the grass. I hear stories like this several times a day. Our frontline staff at Kennedy Krieger hears these types of stories from desperate families several times a day. And this is an old conversation. Um, it's somewhat of a, a difficult conversation again to, um, to hear, but um, this reflects a family's experience. Uh, this was several years ago when a father was asking me about that French test, a risk that was designed to look at um, single nucleotide polymorphisms of a fetus um, to ideally decide if there was an increased risk for autism. And um, so this parent wanted to know about that test. And I said, well, yeah, it's, it's a test that, again, is, it's supposed to let you know if there's a heightened risk for autism to allow you to seek like early intervention um, sooner than later. And this parent's response um, verbatim was, cut the shit, Dr. Wachtel. No one wants a kid with autism. My son has suffered enough. I can't watch my grandkids suffer as well. Keep in mind that this father's um, child had also put his head through a plaster wall so many times that he ultimately had muscle fibers and um, um, blood cells in his urine. So uh, this was a family that had been through the ringer and both the child and the family had significantly suffered. Okay. So I always come back to the medical model. It really frustrates me and kind of perplexes me as to why people don't use a medical model in autism or are looking to reject that because everything else in, um, in medicine, for example, asthma, so millions of children have asthma. You could pull a Harriet Lane textbook like off of your um, pediatric shelf and open up and look at um, all sorts of separations of gradations of asthma. It's mild, it's moderate, it's severe, how frequently it happens, what type of medications you need, all sorts of like objective values. Um, why? Why, are, why is something like asthma broken down like this? Well, because uh, people kind of need to breathe and there's best practice and best standards of care in order to optimize the treatment of asthma. And um, really everything in medicine, and I mean, I've been in medicine for about a quarter century now, is based on criteria and ranges, such as you know, common everyday things, diabetes, myopia. I mean, if you open up my medical chart, it lists in my, my chart that I have severe myopia. Um, I don't like the fact that I have severe myopia, but I'm like really glad that um, some people have developed like contact lenses and corrective lenses of other forms for people with severe myopia, because otherwise I wouldn't be here or doing very much at all. But, um, you know, in medicine, otherwise, hypertension, renal failure, cancer, cancer has grades, cancer has stages. Um, you can get uh, arterial occlusion, you can get um, all, all sorts of gradients and um, 
uh, test, they tell you like how much the percent of comas are, are um, graded by scale. And um, unfortunately, what seems to happen in the world of autism is that this type of medical approach and gradation and understanding things according to how they present for the individual in order to seek like the best treatment and the best type of options is starting to be avoided because of the tendency that we've seen increase in the United States over the past 10 to 15 years of not wanting to really talk about anything unpleasant. Um, unfortunately, we live in a world that has become very PC and everyone is fearful of being canceled or um, being like lambasted on social media. And oftentimes we can find ourselves in a situation of blind acceptance of identity over reality, which again is so frustrating because nowhere else in medicine do we experience the same. And again, these diagnoses are important because diagnoses dictate assessment, they dictate treatment, they dictate research, they dictate investigations. Patients with other issues don't get to choose their diagnosis. You don't get to choose what like stage or grade of cancer you have. You don't get to choose your blood pressure like to, or your laboratory values. Like you want your sodium level to be something. And no patient in his right mind would argue that that's how it should be. Um, no cancer patient would want to like grade or stage his own tumor based on his personal preference or his feelings or his identity, because that kid, cancer patient wants to get the most accurate diagnosis that leads to a gold standard treatment and the best outcome. And you'd have to ask, would, would any physician go along with this? Of course not. Um, corrective diagnoses allow for equitable access to critical things, services, both now and long term, funding. There are very few people who are able to pay out of pocket for necessary services, personalized and specialized treatment and interventions, research and advocacy. Um, unfortunately, we see with research as well, and that's where medicine advances, that those with intellectual disability, again, those with autism of profound form, are often excluded from research. And this is something that is just getting worse over time. Um, there is some hope. Um, we do have a lot of organizations, including a National Council on Severe Autism, which is hosting this webinar today, um, speaking out for the cause of profound autism, um, research monies that have been earmarked by the Autism Science Foundation for Profound Autism, the newly formed Profound Autism Alliance, um, increased interest in discussion of profound autism at medical conferences um, with the hope of development of of special interest groups to include international experts on profound autism, as well as the potential in the, in the upcoming years for an ECHO project surrounding profound autism. Uh, unfortunately, we do find ourselves to be constantly stymied. And um, I, I sometimes find myself like looking back and trying to understand where a lot of these terms come from. And nothing about us without us is one that was always been of interest to me. And so I did a little bit of Google searching and found out um, to my great surprise that this is actually a um, term that dates back to um, 16th century Poland and talks about the um, transfer of power or decision-making from the monarch to parliament. So actually kind of a concept along the line of like no taxation without representation, like Boston Tea Party type of thing. Um, but this has become like the moniker of the um, disability movement. And again, you, know, you just have to wonder, well, where else in medicine do you see that? If you want to be a specialist in uh, hypertension, do you have to be being treated for hypertension? If you want to be an oncologist, do you need to have been a childhood survivor of cancer? Like, why is this something that is so emphasized and so blindly accepted? Yeah, yeah. so um, again, this is where we hear this a lot in these um, groups of self-advocates, nothing about us without us. And unfortunately, and I will say um, that I've gotten some feedback that not everyone supports this, but um, it sadly does seem to be that it currently the vast majority of advocates are not interested in looking at those whose presentations are significantly more severe than their own. Um, this is another one that I thought was absolutely ridiculous that um, genetics projects surrounding or surrounding autism were able to be stopped because they hadn't been um, discussed in advance with individuals with autism. Like seriously, like how does that make any sense? Would you stop like a, a project looking at like advanced treatments for breast cancer if you hadn't asked other women who'd experienced breast cancer? This makes absolutely no sense at all. 
Um, sometimes these things like do deteriorate on um, social media and I have learned over time that I should just um, not respond um, because uh, many of these individuals are clearly young people who um, probably do not have a lot of exposure and um, deep understanding, at least on a scientific level, of what they're talking about. And I will point out, um, again, this is kind of a recent caveat, that there are some individuals within the autism and neurodiversity community who have started to look at the idea that profound autism does exist and express some willingness to express that publicly. Sadly, those people have also shared, and I've had some conversations with individuals, that they fear backlash from their peers. Um, interestingly, one person um, shared with me, and I really like this, something that she called the Kardashian phenomenon, that um, she's really tired of people who are playing a role with little to no idea of significant context or history, kind of like the Kardashian sisters um, influencing society in uh, their um, from their Hollywood homes. Okay, so the profound autism proposition, let's get back to this. The profound autism proposition is a term to describe individuals who have significant intellectual disability and IQ below 50, minimal or no language, require around the clock supervision, as well as assistance with activities of daily living. Um, the Lancet has offered this term, um, stating that people might choose not to use it. That's fine. It's not a requirement, but they offer it as a benefit for individuals who do fit into this description for their families and for clinicians with the hope that this term will spur better clinical services, better services, and um, better meet the needs of what they correctly identify as a vulnerable and underserved group of individuals. Um, National Council of, of on Severe Autism has also commented on the um, kind of meaningless grouping together of individuals um, ranging from those who, for example, are you know working as college professors and have been diagnosed with autism um, spectrum disorder and an individual, for example, on, um, on an inpatient unit engaging in very severe challenging behaviors with a low IQ requiring 24 hour supervision and care. So who actually does care? And why are we making a big fuss about this in terms of profound autism? Well, actually it's a really like poignant topic and something that should be at the height of everybody's interest because unfortunately the medical literature demonstrates that severity of autism and associated language and intellectual disability are in fact associated with poor outcome over time. So I always ask, just like anything else in, um, in medicine, which is associated with a poor outcome, doesn't this deserve our utmost attention? Why, why aren't we paying attention to this if um, outcomes for the patients we care for are not good? And if you look at the literature, well, first of all, you see that actually outcomes for individuals with autism in general, even before you separate out profound from other forms of autism, are not as good as those for individuals without autism. The cost of autism and the care of individuals with autism is enormous. Um, quality of life has been found in general in individuals with autism to be lower than that of um, same age um, non-autistic peers with experience such as worse, phys worse physical health, dependence on parents for activities and care. And um, sadly, um, you know, what applies to everybody else also applies to parents of autistic children in that they also do age and can't take care of children um, indefinitely. Now there's little evidence of improvement in autism over the lifetime. Um, this is just a study that demonstrates that mortality has increased in individuals with autism, um, adaptive behaviors pre predicted by psychiatric and behavioral problems, and quality of life. This article also emphasized what we deal with all the time in terms of the vast difficulty in accessing adult services. This slide looks like something disappeared. I'm not sure why, where the title has gone, but I always have techno technological snafus. Um, this was a study looking at um, intellectual disability and the impact of intellectual disability independent of autism. But this is important to look at given that probably 40 to 50% of individuals with autism do have intellectual disability. And in this study, it was demonstrated that those with severe intellectual disability had much lower rates of employment, being married, owning homes, having children. Um, Catherine Ward and other researchers have pointed out what I think these should be like self-obvious and evident to everybody in that 
every IQ point does matter. And um, there's no reason to expect that for somebody with autism, that, system, that um, situation be different in terms of an IQ range than it would be for somebody without autism. Now you can say all you'd like about IQ, IQ tests being like ableist and not validated, but truthfully IQ um, tests um, have been validated and used um, for centuries and are likely just as valid as the tests that tell you what your uh, sodium or potassium levels are or your white count. Um, and uh, okay. These are, these are just some other examples of outcomes. And now we look into um, the differences of individuals with autism who um, also have intellectual disability. And you'll see in the upper right-hand corner or the upper left-hand corner on the slides, just flags indicating the countries from which um, this research originated. Um, this is a United States study looking at 213 individuals diagnosed as toddlers and then followed up 17 years later where only 9% of them no longer met criteria for autism and where it was documented that in 85% of cases, significant intellectual disability at toddler age predicted that found at, um, at age 19. Um, this is a Greek study um, also demonstrating, well, first of all, that the overall outcome for individuals with autism was poor in most cases, and that poor outcome was associated with comorbid disorders and um, comorbid delay in language milestones. Again, one of the components of profound autism suggested by the Lancet Commission. Um, this is an Italian study demonstrating more or less the same, looking at 22 autistic adults with intellectual disability and severe language disorder um, evaluated over 10 years with the Vineland in terms of adaptive skills, finding that the factors predicting outcome included severity of autism, cognitive level, language level, medical and psychiatric comorbidities, and that availability of treatment. Um, this is an Israeli study, so reaching out to the Middle East, um, demonstrating that outcomes for individuals with autism spectrum disorder were um, better for those with higher cognitive and language skills. Again, the um, two main deficits emphasized in that diagnosis of profound autism. This is a combined US and um, British study, um, which emphasized, again, the link of cognitive profiles to adult outcome, as well as um, the possession of language skills by age three and average nonverbal skills by age three, um, with a concluding statement that verbal and nonverbal IQ at age two, and even more strongly at age three, were strong indicators of independence at age 26. Um, and this is a meta-analysis of um, over 12 samples in um, 15 different studies. Again, we're close to half of these individuals had a poor outcome. And um, those with a classic ASD diagnosis much more frequently experienced a poor outcome as compared um, to those with an Asperger diagnosis or a high functioning autism diagnosis. So the literature is somewhat sobering and the literature should be spurring us all on to really care and to really want to um, focus on this very vulnerable group of individuals with language delay, with intellectual delay, with um, adaptive living deficits requiring ongoing supervision and care because their outcomes are worse than those of others. And um, anywhere else in medicine, we would be drawn to um, wanting to help those whose outcomes currently are not optimized. And so I always ask, you know, is it not clear that not everybody with autism is the same? Um, we do see some uh, additional like hopeful like movements towards the future in terms of meaningful delineations. Um, this is a group out of California looking at the Autism Phenome Project where they're hoping to identify what they consider clinically meaningful subgroups of autism so that they can individually tailor clinical care and treatment offerings. Um, we always come back to you know, this question of neurodiversity and whether this is a boon or a bane, um, recognizing that you know, neurodiversity takes a lot of its origins and roots in international civil rights movements and is a response to marginalization of people with um, developmental disabilities. Unfortunately, what we start to see is that some of the people who are on the most severe end of those developmental disabilities, whether it's autism or intellectual disability or other, are in turn marginalized themselves um, when their autism is not recognized as a disorder. 
And um, even more sadly, we come in, come in contact with many individuals who oppose any types of effort to offer treatment, to find a cause, or to offer a cure or relief for any of the individuals served. Um, and again, other things as to, in terms of why this matters and of specific issues facing severe or profound autism, the lack of a universally accepted definition is confusing. It's confusing to make people, to, to people who are developing policies, to people who are writing insurance, um, a, insurance contracts and um, choosing what type of services and living options and um, community options are available to individuals with autism. Profound autism is different. It often requires unique and intensive supports that aren't needed in other forms of autism. Lack of equity in terms of availability of resources and funding um, has become more and more apparent, um, particularly with all the labor shortages and labor force problems that we've experienced in the aftermath of the pandemic. And um, of course, um, autistic children are not gonna remain children for longer than 18 or 21 years, depending on what state you live in. And many of the issues facing profound autism um, negatively impact options that are available when children become adults and can't necessarily live independently in the community or earn a living wage or require supports that are very different from those whose autism is not profound or um, requiring this the same degree of help. I, I always find it um, somewhat of a struggle to deal with like the language wars and the um, kind of cancellation culture that we deal with in the United States and the overwhelming kind of woke culture of everything identity wise must be accepted and we can't use any words that create unsafe spaces or hurt people's feelings kind of my the the I, my most recent experience with that would have been at a conference um, back in the fall where um, actually uh, a parent of a child with profound autism asked about profound autism um, and um, the, the meeting the needs of those individuals with profound autism. And um, an individual in the, in the audience immediately you know, stood up and in like a, a big hullabaloo said that you know, we were creating an unsafe space and we were using trigger words and this was not acceptable. And uh, I wasn't going to say anything before that because I sort of know where these conversations go, but I did stand up and pointed out that if you want to talk about unsafe spaces, I would like to emphasize the child at that time who was recovering on my unit from um, bilateral retinal detachment and was actually slated to have surgery to clear a infection that had been tracking up her leg um, for the past three months. Uh, that would be my definition of an unsafe space. Um, on my unit, um, again, this is something we deal with day to day. There are nearly 200 children on the wait list. Average length of wait time for admission is over a year. Those children who are larger and more aggressive, the kids I finally call like the heavy sluggers tend to wait much longer. There are countless children waiting in emergency rooms or isolated at home and families are at the end of their rope. Um, when you're at your end of the rope, it's suggested that you kind of tie it and hold on. But I think for many of our families, that rope is starting to fray if it hasn't already completely gone. Uh, again, more slow changes in the field, um, literature that's starting to be published, um, looking at our need to address this issue head on and to use the words that we need to use in order to approach profound autism and to allow everybody to um, benefit from the care and treatment options that are out there. I think that um, definitely in our world, those who have the loudest voice are the ones who are most likely to be heard. It's not always easy to have a loud voice and to speak what's not popular or enjoyable to hear. But I've learned over time that um, when you work with vulnerable patients, you really don't have much of a choice in terms of having a loud voice if you're really looking to effectuate change. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes. And I will end there. And I will stop sharing. All righty. Thanks, Dr. I apologize Lichelle. for missing the video. And there was, a, I always manages to have one or two technological snafus, but that was not so bad in the grand scheme of things. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, thank you so, so, so much um, for that wonderful presentation. Um, as you can probably see, we've been deluged with um, questions. I think um, Amy and I will, some of them are more comments than questions, so there aren't really 37 questions necessarily. Um, 
but I think we'll just take turns pitching them at you. And if you guys uh, out there are concerned about timing, it's well on the West Coast, it's 550 now. I said that uh, this would go a little over an hour um, and um, we'll take as many as we can, but I think we'll try to close by about 6.15 my time, which is 9.15 your time. Um, so uh, let's go, Amy, why don't you pitch the first question and let's just do as many as we can. All right. Thank you, Jill, for giving me this opportunity because I'm going to pitch the biggest softball question that's in the chat, which is, what is your honest opinion on the neurodiversity movement, specifically the self-diagnosed bullies who try to claim that severe autism doesn't exist? Well, I think as a professional, I've learned that, um, you know, you have to be nice and sometimes you can't say in like a public setting exactly um, what you feel. Um, that being said, um, uh, sometimes I think that, uh, well, their utterances, um, if I, I have not been told that um, my videos are disturbing or creating an unsafe space, but I think if I was in a professional setting, I would be highly likely to suggest that the door is right behind you and please leave if you're not interested in um, learning about this topic. Um, but I think like a, a better way to approach it because it probably is true that being more conciliatory, conciliatory is a better way to accomplish things than um, being inflammatory is to, you know, kind of turn it around in terms of what we all deal with or what we've all been exposed to in recent years in terms of thinking about equity and equality and, you know, across the board. And I always kind of ask, no matter what you're talking about in terms of acceptance for all, how can you really champion acceptance for whatever you're championing, whether it's across races or religions or sexual orientations or levels of disability, how can you really be a champion of that topic if you're excluding somebody or excluding a category of individuals? That just seems truly like incongruous. And I think that, you know, sometimes putting it in that perspective and encouraging people to look at the fact that what they're doing may in turn actually be excluding other groups of people. So completely undermining the mission, like that just makes no sense. So um, I do try and be conciliatory when, when possible, but um, I also think that it's really important to, you know, be truthful and honest. And sometimes you do have to call like a spade a spade and we can't always like pursue fantasy when reality is uh, right there in front of our faces. Thank you. Um, we have a question about ECT, um, which was a hot topic on our Facebook page recently. ECT, uh, for those who don't know, refers to electroconvulsive therapy. It's not the same as shock treatment, like a behavioral type shock treatment. Um, it is basically an induced seizure. And some of these ECT treatments are real lifesavers for um, children and adults with very severe autism and catatonia and mental illness. Um, the, uh, the writer asks, can you make your paper multi-year evaluation of maintenance ECT in an adult with ASD available at no cost? <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's behind a paywall and that's why she's ask asking. Um, yeah, if anyone um, is interested in any of those papers um, and they emailed me directly, I have those all on my hard drive and could share those. Maybe you can share your email if you're willing in chat. Not that you get enough emails all the time. Anyway, the doctor works out. Um, sure. Could you uh, speak a bit about the success of ECT in young adults with episodes of severe internal stimuli-driven obsessive and or physically aggressive behavior? Yeah, you were typing your, your name, so your, your email, so you didn't hear my question. No, 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 I didn't know it's fine. <laughs> So, yeah, so ECT is really um, kind of like a, a game changer and truly one of the most powerful agents that we have in the psychiatric armamentarium. I mean, after decades of drug development, um, still when um, things that you can swallow don't get the, um, the job done, um, ECT is usually that intervention that is a winner. Um, that being said, it's really important to know what ECT addresses and what it does not. And in individuals with um, autism spectrum disorder, similar to the general population, we're looking at discrete entities such as um, catatonia, um, major depression, um, other affective illnesses, psychotic illnesses, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, 
with autism and associated um, repetitive and, and, and what I guess behavioral therapists prefer to as like internally driven um, challenging behaviors, um, we're really looking at um, behaviors such as repetitive self-injury or aggressive behaviors that um, are often seen as part and parcel of a catatonia diagnosis. So many of those individuals uh, will have additional catatonic symptoms um, that are easily detected by um, a physical examination or usage of a, a rating scale. And then most importantly, um, kind of the linchpin of the behaviors is that uh, ECT is not beneficial for individuals with autism and repetitive behaviors whose behaviors are linked to, for example, escape from demands, access to attention, um, access to tangibles. Um, that is a whole different can of worms. And those individuals obviously um, respond to classic like ABA-based interventions. But for individuals where um, the challenging behaviors are more a manifestation of ongoing psychomotor agitation along the lines of a catatonic um, disorder, then ECT can be exquisitely um, beneficial and um, oftentimes has benefited individuals with autism who have not benefited from months to years of other therapies. Um, several people asked about um, how profound autism could become a real uh, diagnosis um, that would require the American Psych Psychiatric Association who produces the DSM to make those changes in the, in the DSM. And I believe there is some work that's happening to try to make that a reality. Uh, right now, the Lancet Commission proposed um, profound autism as an administrative term, which it's like a nothing word to say, you know, we're interested in this, but we don't have the power to make it a true diagnostic entity. Um, but I, th I think that I wouldn't be surprised to see that happen in the future. What do you think, Dr. Wachtel? No, I think that's very, uh, very possible. I mean, and if you look at the history of the DSM, we've seen how like autism has changed really with very, with every iteration of the DSM, dramatically different, obviously, from the DSM, um, the first and second edition, and each iteration brings along ongoing changes. It's also interesting to see, again, I mean, you have to keep in mind that the DSM is not necessarily the final word of everything. It Again, it, it didn't come from above. And there are other organizations, including um, an organization at the um, NIMH, who has an, I cannot remember the acronym, but they're looking at a kind of different classification system for um, psychiatric illnesses, kind of along like symptom groups with a recognition that oftentimes in the DSM patients who are like completely like diametrically different are getting the same diagnosis and this might not lead to um, best treatment and clinical outcomes. So I think there is hope for the DSM and I think there's also hope um, and you know the NIMH is not just a, a random organization floating new ideas That's a pretty significant organization in the US looking at other classification systems that um, could be beneficial as well. Related to that, um, Amira asks, um, what about those people who argue that our kids are this way due to intellectual disability, i.e. they're autistic but the ID, not the autism, is the problem. Do people with ID have these types of behaviors? So a lot of individuals with intellectual disability I mean, separate from autism you know, have challenging behaviors and people, we know that people with intellectual disability, again, separate from autism, have an increased risk of psychiatric comorbidities, behavioral disturbances, medical comorbidities. Um, I think that's, you know, I think that's a good question in terms of which part of the presentation. Is it the autism or is it the intellectual disability or is it a combination of both that's leading to um, the presentation? Um, you know, I can't see how anybody could argue that fewer IQ points is going to put you at additional risk. And I kind of think of it from kind of a brain based, like a structural level that if you have autism and you have intellectual disability, there's probably a greater extent of um, not optimal wiring or connectivity um, within that individual's brain. And, you know, again, we're dealing with the brain. This is like the seat of behavioral and psychiatric concerns. And when you have like that double whammy of the underlying like imbalance in an autistic brain with like excitatory and inhibitory like neurotransmitters plus intellectual disability, no matter what um, that the etiology of that is, it would seem to me most reasonable to think that both of those are are contributing and that it's not simply the intellectual disability that takes an individual with autism who otherwise would have 
none of these issues. And, you know, and even that's not true because there are individuals with autism without intellectual disability who um, have significant challenges, both behavioral challenges as well as um, severe psychiatric comorbidities. In our individuals with autism without intellectual disability, we often, you know, have um, issues related to suicidality, intensive anxiety, depression. And so the literature is kind of right there, giving you some pointers in that direction. So there are lots of questions about asking your opinions about specific therapies, including TMS, DBS, medical marijuana. What have you found on your unit to be most effective in treating dangerous behaviors like aggression and self-injury? That's a good question. Um, okay, well, first of all, I can answer the marijuana question easily in stating that um, we don't prescribe um, epidiolex or medical marijuana on our unit. So I do not have much experience um, with medical marijuana other than kind of anecdotal experiences from families who have tried that. And have I've heard varying things. I, the children who are ultimately are admitted to the MBU who've tried medical marijuana, it didn't work for them. Otherwise they wouldn't have been admitted. Um, and I always caution people in that, you know, it's unreasonable to expect that a psychoactive substance would only potentially have positive benefits. For some people I've heard it has helped them, but you have to keep in mind that it could have negative um, impact as well. In terms of challenging behaviors in general, I mean, I've worked on the neurobehavioral unit now going on 20 years, and I'm a firm believer in our neurobehavioral model, um, and really that um, tandem usage of expertise in applied behavioral analysis and classic psychiatric understanding and pharmaco pharmacology in terms of breaking down kind of problem behaviors to understand the environmental and the biological components and to target um, treatments, um, particularly based on the etiology of what we're seeing. And I recognize that that takes like a lot of time. It's a kind of a painstaking process. Um, there are not enough of those services, but I do always come back to no matter kind of where you're working or who you're working with, um, the most important question to ask when um, someone says, my child is having challenging behavior in autism is to ask um, why? Um, because the knee-jerk reaction of just prescribing risperidone or Abilify, since the FDA says those, those help with self-injury and aggression, um, oftentimes doesn't work out to be very fruitful if you haven't understood the why. So that would probably be like my, my most important takeaway from working um, in, with this population over the past two decades is that you need to understand why. You need to kind of separate it out. I kind of look at things as like whether you wanted to say like a, you know, a, um, an onion that you need to peel or like a, a, a puzzle piece that you need that comes in a box all mixed up and first you have to put all the pieces to the color side and then you have to separate out the edges and the angles and group them by like color pattern. Um, you, you really do need to get a deep understanding in terms of what's, what's driving those challenging behaviors. And that's not even talking about potential like medical um, comorbidities that might impact. And that would probably bring me to like another important um, thing that I've learned in working with challenging behaviors is that need for a team of individuals, that these problems are rarely solved by one person. It's not usually like a single silver bullet that um, is gonna get the relief that you're looking for. Particularly once you get to the point where these things have become entrenched and continued for a long period of time. Um, you asked about TMS, DBS. Um, yeah, I think it's really important to draw a distinction between electroconvulsive therapy and other forms of like brain stimulation. Um, you know, my mentor, um, Max Fink, suggests that BS, um, standing for brain stimulation, actually stands for something else. But, uh, the, you know, it's always important to remember that electroconvulsive <laughs> therapy works because of the convulsion. It doesn't work because of the electricity. It works because of the convulsion um, that is um, generated deep within the cortex and then leads to um, changes within the brain that are beneficial for a wide range of psychopathology and other forms of brain stimulation um, with the exception of like um, magnetic um, stimulation therapy using a magnet to induce a seizure or um, using like a gas to induce a seizure. Other forms of brain stimula stimulation don't induce a seizure. And therefore the um, immediate and long-term long -term downstream effects of that seizure are not experienced. 
Yeah, and just to say, I think that Jill pointed this out that they we recently did three webinars about ECT and autism, and um, and all Podcasts. of us participated. Yeah, um, so if you're interested in ECT and autism, my son has been getting ECT since for almost 13 years now, so almost exactly 13 years now, and uh, you know it's been transformative for us. And if you're interested in ECT, we have the that resource on our on our website. I encourage you to check it out. Uh, so a couple of people have asked about where in profound autism is there, the, I mean, the Lancet does not include unsafe behaviors like aggression, self-injury, elopement in their definition of, of profound autism. Do you think that that should be part of it? Well, I think that the Lancet didn't necessarily, I think that they sort of cast like a wide net um, so that they wouldn't necessarily exclude individuals with intellectual disability, language delay, who require those 24-hour supports and um, ongoing assistance with ADLs who didn't have the challenging behaviors. So I think that the net was probably cast to include as many individuals as possible. And it, I guess a case could be made for further like stratification within profound autism to emphasize those individuals with the challenging behaviors and psychiatric comorbidities. But it might sort of actually already be there knowing that people with intellectual disability have that high risk of psychiatric and um, behavioral pathology like right off the bat. And I do like the idea of being like as inclusive as possible because we wouldn't want to exclude somebody who had significant cognitive delay, language delay, and needed those supports but didn't have the behaviors. And so I think being more inclusive is probably better than being exclusive because ideally it should allow us to meet the needs of a wider range of, of individuals. Okay, um, Amy, do you wanna pitch another one? Sure. There are definitely several questions in the chat about how you measure intellectual disability in, in autistic children. Can you speak to that? So I don't do um, um, IQ testing. Um, that would, I'm not a neuropsychologist. That would typically be um, done by uh, a neuropsychologist. And um, there are a wide range of um, options for um, IQ testing with a wide range of individuals. And I have seen um, people who have been evaluated with um, different batteries. For example, people who are not verbal, people whose communication skills are um, limited in other ways, people who have other sensory deficits, people who are deaf, people who are blind, and people with intellectual disability. There are a wide range of um, batteries out there that allow for um, IQ or cognitive testing for individuals with autism um, plus, so whether it's a sensory deficit or whether it's lack of verbal skills or intellectual disability. Um, I, we always refer people to, you know, expert neuropsychologists who are able to select the appropriate battery that meets that individual's needs. Obviously, like a Stanford Binet is not going to be something that's going to meet the vast um, majority of individuals' needs. But um, within the neuropsychology kind of armamentarium of um, testing batteries, there are multiple options for um, giving an accurate estimate of um, intellectual functioning in individuals with a range of of um, disability. Um, okay, um, gosh, you know, so many questions related to, to treatment. And interestingly, you know, this wasn't really a webinar about treatment. We've had Dr. Wachtel on webinars before um, that were specifically about treatment. And I think what I'm kind of seeing here is that um, we have a lot of people with many kind of specific questions relating to various forms of medications and treatments. And um, I, 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 my response to that is, let's do another webinar about that. <laughs> you know, we also have two other people on our board who are leading psychiatrists in this field. And um, maybe I can persuade, you know, all of them, <laughs> uh, all of our uh, board member psychiatrists um, to, to join in a webinar specifically about, about that because it's, it's too much 
for, for us to handle in the remaining few minutes. So I know that's not the answer you wanted to hear, but um, we will have we will be able to devote much more time to it. Okay, um, Amy, what do you have? Ahead. Yeah. So there are a couple of questions about at what age you could come up, what you could kind of attach a diagnosis of profound autism and whether or not that would be stable over the lifespan. I do think it's important to note that, you know, NCSA has a position paper about this. We've that you obviously can't attach a diagnosis of profound autism to a toddler. Uh, their diagnostic, you know, their prognosis is, is still unclear. It's impossible to know uh, what their developmental trajectory is gonna look like. I mean, we've said about eight years old, I mean, Dr. Rochtel, what's your experience about when it becomes clear, you know, kind of how severe, uh, how severely autistic a, a, you know, a child is gonna be? And do you, and you, and you said that, uh, the literature shows that that these um, kind of severity levels are pretty stable over the lifespan, but maybe you can say something more about that. Um, yeah, yeah, I just want to say the Lancet Commission itself is applies it only to older children and not they don't apply a profound autism to younger children. Anyway, go, go ahead, Dr. Rochtel. Right. So I think the Lancet Commission um, also uses the cutoff of age eight, stating that the diagnosis eight. really shouldn't yeah. be applied to somebody who's under age eight, even though some of the literature um, really supports that, you know, levels of intellectual disability and language disability might be enduring. And you have a lot of prediction based on what, how somebody age two or three might present. But, um, you know, I would tend to um, go with the old, with the older age, seven or eight, because in that two to three year old range, I mean, that's where we're really in like the height of early intervention and optimization of um, language skills, optimization of um, activities of daily living and all of those necessary skills and trying to get that young person, that toddler or preschooler kind of bump them up in the developmental notches. Um, and I think it would be a mistake to look at, you know, a two-year-old or a three-year-old and just expect that that kind of that's what you're going to get. And that's also not really supported by the literature because I think one of, you know, one of the best prognostic factors that we always come back to would be like language skills at like age five, age six. And um, so I don't think we can like just reject or um, discount the any of the role of like intensive or early intervention and then maybe reconsidering when that child becomes like more of like a school-age child. <laughs> not to say that, and, and that's also not to say that um, even if individual has profound autism or has intellectual disability associated with autism, that they're not gonna learn and they're not gonna keep developing. Um, what the profound autism diagnosis would suggest, however, is that they're not necessarily going to develop to the point that they're gonna live independently or run for office and attend college. Great. Um, somebody asked, I think this will be our last question. Maybe that may be one more with Amy after this. And we said, where's the congressional hearings about this? <laughs> we need, uh, I mean, obviously um, I, and I think I can speak for NCSA as a whole, um, you know, we see this issue as the rapidly growing population of children and adults with profound autism as a, an almost, um, you know, catastrophic, issue for public health. Um, this is a, a major issue with many implications for long-term care, as Dr. Wachtel said, you know, especially as parents begin to fade away. Um, and, uh, you know, we have very few real solid answers in current policy, as we all know. Um, and Dr. Wachtel explained very well what she sees on a daily basis. Um, should this be a topic for a congressional hearing? Absolutely, yes, it should. Do you even see autism mentioned in like a single presidential debate? No. I mean, this is up there with, you know, COVID and climate change, in my opinion, um, but it receives very scant attention. And when it does receive attention, it tends to be on the more trivialized side of things. So, you know, obviously NCSA is in favor of raising the profile of these issues and, um, and, and making it more of a national priority, but this is not something that happens overnight. Someday there will be congressional hearings about it, but it's not gonna happen tomorrow. In the meantime, the DSM is not a congressional issue. The DSM is an issue for a private organization, which is the American Psychiatric Association and a, a private board you know, that, that makes these, these decisions. And um, you know, we uh, will probably see some changes over time there, but again, 
not overnight. Amy, do you have one more question you want to ask? And then I think yeah, I found a question I think is a really good one to end on, which is what are like, can you share some success stories from your unit? What would that even look like? Oh, well, I could, no, I could talk for a long time about success stories from our unit. Um, well, Amy's son would be one. Um, so I think in terms of success, you know, it's always a question of tempering your success in terms of what you're looking for um, along those lines. I cannot say that we've had individuals, you know, leave the neurobehavioral unit and attend Ivy League institutions or, um, you know, start um, tech startups in um, out in California. And um, what I can say is that, um, you know, in the, the during the time of the existence of the neurobehavioral unit, which um, significantly predates my arrival, so the neurobehavioral unit dates back to the 1980s, um, there are an infinite number of um, success stories. And those would be along the lines of individuals who really the success has surrounded um, overcoming their behavioral and psychiatric comorbidities. So that once that those were, once that those um, components of their presentation were under control, that person was then able to get back to, I guess, one of the goals of Kendi Krieger, we always talk about helping the child or the adult reach their innate potential. And so success stories would be um, helping that child and that family, you know, reach the child's innate potential. It might not be the potential that the parents are hoping for. Um, it might not be what we are hoping for for the vast majority of, ch of our children, but it's looking at what the innate potential of that person was and really freeing them from the, um, from the psychiatric and behavioral conditions that were preventing them, and sometimes medical conditions, comorbid medical conditions that were preventing them from getting to that potential. Appreciate that. Okay, thank you so much, um, Dr. Amy Lutz and Dr. Lee Wachtel um, for your time tonight. And as I said, this recording will be posted um, on our homepage and you should be getting an email about it as well. So thank you so much and wishing everybody a good night.